I do want to take a moment to thank our friends of the library for their generous support for today's program. And uh, here's just a little background for those not familiar with uh, Ron Brown. After decades spent traveling the world and picking up university degrees from Jerusalem, Harvard, and Geneva, Dr. Ron Brown settled in New York City in 1992. He's been teaching history, ethnic studies, and political science at Toro College and world religions at the Unification Theological Seminary for over 25 years. He has been deeply involved in the cultural life of New York City through his work as a featured speaker at the New York Historical Society, New York Council for the Humanities, and numerous other libraries, historical societies, colleges, and universities. And we're welcoming uh, Dr. Ron Brown back today to take us around the world to Moscow. So take it away, Ron. Okay. Thank you very much, Jeff. And welcome, everybody, to another virtual visit to one of the most exciting cities in the world. I don't know if you were with me last month when we visited Bombay, one of the wonderful megalopolises, 50 million people. Well, we are now going to visit Moscow. We do have one other talk scheduled for this fall season, and that is going to be on December 17th, and that will be Petra. I'm sure a lot of you have visited um, the city of Petra, the lost city in the desert in the south of Jordan. Fascinating history that the city flourished at a time when the world was changing. Rome, Egypt, the Middle East, Israel, the great empires really touched nose in the city of Petra. So that will be on December 17. Then in January, I'm going to be off. I still haven't decided where I'm going to go for my January vacation. But when I get back in February, I'll definitely let you know. And I'll definitely let the library know that I have a whole roster of new exciting cities to visit. So now, once again, uh, if you do have questions or comments, feel free to use the chat function, which you see it on the toolbar up there. And when I'm finished, uh, we will take the questions that you've typed in first. And then at the very end, after about an hour, we will um, permit you to unmute yourself. And I'd love to hear some of your experiences about visiting Moscow. As you can see from the outline, I was there in 1991, 1992, uh, spent the winter there and a summer. And so that was the time when I got to Moscow, my visa said, welcome to the USSR. And when I left a year later, it said, thank you for visiting the Russian Republic. The flags had changed, the Kremlin had changed, and, uh, and I experienced that. So every city is not just <clears throat> a wonderful city, but it is a person interacting with a city. So Moscow, the third Rome outline. Number one, destination Moscow, how I got there, really quite by accident. Number two, a little bit about the history of the Slavs, the great Slavic race, which includes Russians and Poles and Czechs and Bulgarians and Serbs, Ukrainians, Belarusians. And then what it means to be the third Rome, Rome in Italy, Constantinople, the second Rome, and Moscow as the heir to the Roman Empire. My wonderful experiences working at the Hotel Balchuk Kempinski. Kempinski is the Hilton of five-star hotels in the world. Daily life in Moscow. How was it to live in Moscow with the collapse of an empire? Free travel and the geography, the sun never sat when I was there in the summer and it never got light in the middle of the night. So let's get started. Well, like most baby boomers, I went to college at Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania. And then I was start traveling after I graduated, ended up at the Hebrew University where I did my first MA. Then I ended up at Harvard where I got my second MA. 
And then I went to University of Geneva in Switzerland, where I got my PhD. So finally, I was done with education. Well, barely had I graduated from the University of Geneva when the Soviet empire began to collapse. Now, for a lot of you listening to me today, we are baby boomers. We grew up with the Cold War. I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis when my father was boarding up the windows to our cellar, taking down gallons of water, even in rural Pennsylvania, where nobody in their right mind would think of dropping an atomic bomb. But the Cold War was part of my life. I'm sure you remember hiding under your desks in school as if that flimsy desk above my head was going to save me, save me from an atomic war. But that was my generation and probably a lot of your generations. As baby boomers, the Cold War, the rivalry with Russia, the Soviet empire dominated our childhood. I was born in March 3rd, 1949, and grew up in the age of the Cold War. Well, by 1989, this world was collapsing. You had Zalidanos in Poland and the rise of the independent movement, um, which eventually overthrew the Polish communist government. The Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. I got there in the middle of this Velvet Revolution. The Russian Revolution, August 1991, I was there for that. I went to Berlin and saw the ruins of the wall where the Berlin Wall had collapsed. During the height of the Cold War, I spent six months living in West Berlin where I'd sneak through the wall, go over to East Germany, East Berlin, and uh, experience life under the communists. I didn't sneak across because as an American, I was allowed to go through Checkpoint Charlie. But it was an experience for an American in my early 20s to go across to East Berlin, see the Russian troops all over, and then go back to West Berlin. So that really dominated my life. Well, as the Soviet Union began to collapse. I was living in Boston, where I had just finished my dissertation for my second MA at the Divinity School at Harvard. Well, when I saw what was happening in Eastern Europe, I said, my God, I'm a historian. I have to be part of this. So I had an auction, yard sale, sold everything I owned in, in Boston, shipped a few things back to my parents' house in Pennsylvania. And I said, I want to see what's happening in Eastern Europe. So I arrived in Paris on October 14, 1990, visited all my friends in Paris, and then I went East. I arrived in Prague, November 30th, 1990. Early December, went up to visit friends in what was once West Berlin, which was now unified Berlin, visited Poland in February 1991, spent a summer in Vienna from May to September. Then I spent a year in Budapest teaching English from September to June, Bulgaria for Easter 1992. And I arrived in Moscow June 19th, 1992, and stayed until the winter destroyed me in Berlin, in Moscow, and I fled in January 19, 1993. Well, I wanted to see what was happening. I mean, who could experience the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the change of government in Prague, in Budapest, and then finally in Moscow? And these are the kinds of newspapers I was reading. We see Die Mauer ist weg. The wall is gone. Berlin ist wieder Berlin. 
Berlin is once again Berlin. These were exciting times to be traveling around Eastern Europe. Well, let's step back in history, go back to about 4000 BC, when we see the Indo-Europeans. Well, the Indo-Europeans were a people who emerged in what is today Russia and um, Ukraine and Belarus. And as the name Indo-European means, one half went to India and Persia, one half went to Europe. In the East, they became the Indians, the Pakistanis, the Persians, the Armenians, and the Georgians. In the West, they became Germans and French and Italians and Greeks and Spanish, Norwegians and English. So we are part of this great migration of 4,000 years. Well, one of these groups of Indo-Europeans that was gallivanting around the world at that time was a tribe called the Slavs. And the Slavs settled in what is today Russia. And in those wonderful days before internet and um, um, YouTube videos, uh, I mean, there was really not much to do for these poor Slavs back in the year 500 AD. And so they spent their time just making new babies. Well, a population explosion happened and they became too numerous and they too started migrating. One group went to the West and became what we know as the Poles. Another group went a little bit further South and became Czechs and Slovaks. Another group went even further south and became the Serbs, the Croatians, the Slovenes, and the Bulgarians. And so this is the great migration from 500 to 700 of the common era that became known as the Slavs. Well, the Slavs were barbarians back in those days. I mean, they were worshiping trees and spirits in the woods and uh, they wanted to become a civilized people. So there was a case, famous King Vladimir I and he started shopping around and he said, well, in Western Europe, we have Roman Catholics down in Rome and Italy and France and half of Germany. And in the middle, we have the Byzantine, the Greeks in Greece and Turkey with their capital in Constantinople. Further south, we have the Muslims in Mecca. And so King Vladimir the Great, as he is called, had to choose. Am I going to become Catholic? Am I going to become Greek Orthodox? Or am I be going to become Muslims? So the legend is he invited representatives from the three great empires. Well, he invited a bunch of priests from Rome and he interviewed them. And they said, well, you know, we're Catholics, and so our priests can't get married. Well, Vladimir said, oh my God, if our priests can't get married, uh, that just won't work. So he refused to become Roman Catholic. He invited a Muslim, and the Muslim says, well, you know, we're not allowed to drink alcohol. And Vladimir says, my God, even in these barbarian days, a Russian would die in 10 minutes without a bottle of vodka. So he refused to become Muslim. And then he brought in the Greek Orthodox priest. And the Greek Orthodox priest gave him a bottle of wine, had his wife with him. And he said, you know, oh, we're a more civilized people than these terrible Catholics and Muslims. And the great Vladimir the Great, the first king of modern Russia, converted to the Greek Orthodox Church. He ruled from 980 to 1015. Now, very important, he said, if I'm going to become Greek Orthodox, if you look at the map on the right, you see what was Russia, that pink part. To the south, you see the Byzantine Empire. 
The second Rome was Constantinople. So Vladimir the Great said, I'll become a Greek Orthodox. I'll teach my people to be Greek Orthodox. I'll teach them the Greek alphabet. I'll invite uh, Byzantine generals and doctors and lawyers and administrators to drag my barbaric people into the modern world. But he said, I also want a wife who is related to the emperor of Byzantium itself. So the, the emperor of Constantinople convinced one of his nieces, Anna, to go to Russia, marry this barbarian king, and do her part in civilizing the Russians. So from that day, King Vladimir said, I am related to the emperors of the Roman Empire. And he started calling himself the heir to Rome. And when the city of Moscow was built, he called it the new Rome, the third Rome. So Russians joined in to what we would call modern human history. Well, as soon as you convert to Christianity, all the Jewish prophets and Bible people are going to be studied. So Russians started naming themselves Adam. Girls would take the name Eve. Isaac was very common. Abraham. They have adopted Christian history. Mary and uh, Joseph and John and Matthew became great heroes in Russia. Children named their children, uh, families named their children after people in the Jewish Bible and the Christian Bible. And the czar, the king said, well, if I'm the new Caesar, I will call myself Caesar Vladimir the Great. Well, Caesar translated into Russian, as czar. Well, the Greeks were eager to have all these wonderful converts joining the Greek church and not the hated Muslim religion or the even more hated Catholic religion. And so the Greeks sent teachers, engineers, generals, they built monasteries, they developed the alphabet that the Russians use until today. They brought in doctors, administrators, accountants. In fact, Tsar Vladimir the Great surrounded himself with Greeks, teachers, engineers, generals, doctors, administrators, and accountants. And Russia, you can say, entered European history. The Bible was translated into Russian. The Orthodox churches always have a big dome, just like Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. They, developed, they brought the dress of the Greek Orthodox bishops with the crown and the staff. They started developing icons just like the Greeks. So art, music, architecture, and everything else was brought to Russia from the Byzantine Empire. Well, this beginning under Vladimir the Great, first kingdom was known as Kiev Rus. The Mongols invaded, destroyed Kiev Rus. And so what they did is they simply moved north and built a new capital, which we today call Moscow. And so Moscow was called itself the third. Rome. Well, in 1453, the Muslims invaded the last bits of the Byzantine Empire, and they conquered Constantinople. Hundreds of thousands of refugees, Greek-speaking scholars and professors, doctors and lawyers, fled north to the new Rome, Moscow. And even more Russian czars intermarried with 
the Greek aristocracy, Ivan the third married Sophia, the niece of the last Byzantine empire. So Moscow, as it emerged, developed a very strong identity. We are the new Rome. Moscow and the Russian people are destined to constitute a great empire, and Moscow is destined to rival Rome and Constantinople as the great chosen city of God. The Russians have a divine mission. The Russian Orthodox Church is the only true church. So the Russians never have considered themselves just another dumpy little country somewhere. They are the heir to Rome, as the name Tsar repre represents. They are the new Caesars. And so whether they were Tsar Vladimir the Great or Tsar Putin today in Moscow, this has shaped the mentality and the identity of the Russians, and it has permeated the city of Moscow. Well, from Moscow, you see the map on the left, they began expanding. To the south were still the barbarian Mongols who had decimated the old cities of Kiev Rus. And so Moscow developed northward. Cities like Zuzdal, like Novgorod, all these wonderful cities that I visited when I lived there, the Russians expanded north. And then gradually they began to push out the Mongols and the Tatars and the Muslim people and expand down to the south. By 1914, we see the map on the right. Russia had even occupied Finland, most of Poland, big chunks of Romania, the Ukraine, Belarus, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia pushing over into Armenia and Georgia and Azerbaijan and expanding into Southern Central Asia. So the Russians believe that they are one of the great nations of the earth. It was Tsar Ivan III who adopted the title Tsar in 1472 and See the picture of him on the right, wearing the, the sable uh, trimmed crown of the Tsar of Russia. In the other picture, you see his wife, the niece of Constantine the 11th, the last Byzantine emperor. So Russia had a notion of manifest destiny expanding from Poland to the Pacific Ocean, expanding down into Central Asia, even trying to take over Afghanistan. And their manifest destiny was no different from that of the United States, expanding from the Atlantic across to the Pacific, invading Mexico and stealing everything between Texas and California, expanding into the Pacific, overthrowing the government in Hawaii, annexing islands in the Pacific and the Philippines. So the Russians saw themselves as like, very much like another United States destined to rule the world. The oldest church in Moscow is the Cathedral of the Dormition of 1479. Look at that church. Look at those tiny, narrow windows. You ask yourself, is that a fort or is that a church? Well, the domes tell you it's a church, but the lower half was a fort because Russia was still a rather wild place. Civil wars, invasions by the Poles and the Swedes, invasions from the South by the Muslim Tatars and Kazakhs. And so through most of its history, Russia has been very aware that unlike the United States, which is protected by two oceans and has two relatively small and weak countries to the north, Canada, 
into the South Mexico. Russia, on the other hand, has Germany on one side, Japan on the other side, China to the South, the uh, Muslim world to the South. And so Russians realize that if they are not well armed and organized and and, and um, commanded by a strong leader, Russia will be invaded and decimated. Well, Moscow became the third Rome. And like the first Rome in Italy and the second Rome of Constantinople, they wanted the world to know that they were the new Rome. In 1561, the famous St. Basil's Cathedral was built in Moscow, right off of what was, what was known as Red Square. Now, if anybody asks you why it's called Red Square, it's because the word in Russian for red means both the color red and beautiful. And so when we say red square, we could also say the beautiful square. Look at these elements of architecture, these swirling multicolored domes. Russia is aware that it is a blend of Asian beauty and of Western culture. On the left, you see the inside, mosaics everywhere, incense burners, icons of saints, magnificent decorations. Now, when you look at St. Basil's, you think like, oh, that's a big church. But actually, when you go in, it is very, very small. It's more or less a monument more than it is a church. When we're in, a, in America, we're used to churches and synagogues and mosques with big open spaces for thousands of people. St. Basil's was the personal chapel of the czar. And so there were not thousands of people who were there. Now, this notion of Moscow as the third Rome, Russia having an imperial destiny equal to that of ancient Rome and the Byzantine Empire, remains a constant feature of Russian history. Under the czars, expanding, taking over Finland and Poland, and even going to war against China and Japan. Well, when the communists took over, got rid of the czar, the Russians became, the communists became just as Russian as everybody else, saying Russia, now that it's communist, but it is still part of this great imperial destiny. Just like Vladimir Putin has, uh, today, stands up to Europe, stands up to the United States, stands up to China and Japan saying, we are a great power that is part of our imperial destiny. Well, when I got to Russia in June of 1992, You'd hardly call Russia an imperial power. Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin was the prime minister in 1991-1999. And as everybody knows, he was infamous for his drinking. Very often he would show up at cabinet meetings and he could hardly stand up. Well, under him, Communism ended in Russia. And nobody knew what shape imperial Russia was going to assume with the end of communism. Shortly before I arrived, the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia declared independence. August 1991, the Ukraine and Uzbekistan left the Soviet Union, declared independence. December 25th, Russia stopped using the Soviet Union title and called itself the Russian Republic. Well, Russia was afraid. Under Yeltsin, Europe was expanding. The United States and Western Europe were taking over Poland and moving into Czechoslovakia 
to try to get them to abandon Russia and become part of NATO and the European community. Russia was in chaos when I got there. The only fascinating thing that happened right after I arrived was the opening of the first McDonald's. Well, of course, people like Thomas Friedman were thrilled and wrote in the New York Times, uh, peace had arrived because no two countries that both had a McDonald's had ever fought a war against each other. So Thomas Friedman argued this was going to be the golden age. Well, unfortunately, McDonald's didn't have coffee, so I never went there because I'm a coffee drinker, but they did have hamburgers and they trained all of the young people to work there. The lines were sometimes three and four hours for all these young people that could get in to McDonald's. Well, in the eyes of the Russians, this McDonald's, which claimed to be the largest McDonald's on the face of the earth, was viewed by many McDonald's as the beginning of American imperialism, what they called the coca colonization of Russia. And Yeltsin's fame declined because he was accused of basically handing over the country to Americans and foreigners. So at the same time as you'd have thousands of people lined up waiting to get into McDonald's, at the same time you had people going by throwing stones at McDonald's at the decline of Russia. Well, this is the um, Tumirayev University, which is the agricultural university of Moscow. It was founded in 1865, part of the westernization attempt by the Russian czars, or, uh, right? In the um, Civil War time in America, the Russians were bringing over German agronomists, Americans, British, to modernize Russian agriculture. Well, I was put in contact with Dr. Ildis Norgaliev, who I appointed as my business manager. Since I was teaching English, he would come up with a job, such as teaching a weekly class at the Agricultural University, teaching all these young farmers and agronomists how to speak English, how to read the Wall Street Journal, uh, how to have a conversation in modern conversational English. So the agreement was he would find me a job, he would take 10% of all of my jobs, and I would keep 90%. Well, of course, I was being paid in Russian rubles. Well, look at this graph on the right, the Russian ruble, 1990, skyrocketing the blue line, and then sinking in value. When I got there in June of 1992, I was getting 10 rubles to the dollar. When I left in January of the following year, I was getting 100 rubles per dollar. But everybody wanted to learn English. And English conversation was the goal. Many of the so my students who were professors at the university, scientists, politicians, whatnot, they could read the Wall Street Journal. They'd bring in copies of the International Economic Journal, asking me questions about the economic terminology, but they had never had a conversation in English. So they could read the Wall Street Journal but they didn't know how to ask, where's the bathroom? So their English conversation skills were non-existent, but they realized that if they were going to survive in a world where English is the international language, 
they needed English conversation. Well, this was fun because I was constantly being invited to dinner, but I always knew that they were inviting me to dinner so that they could have some great English conversation. But when I was there in 91 and 92, even though communism had ended, all of my classrooms still had the hammer and sickle. They had statues of Marx and Lenin all over the place. Uh, uh, my ID card in Russia still had the picture of Lenin and the USSR because it was taking a long time for the paperwork to catch up with the rapidly changing political situation. One of my great students was Svatoslav Nikolaya Feodorov. He's the one who invented LASIK. Many of you have ever had your eyes um, corrected with LASIK. He was the one who came up with the name LASIK, and he was the one who organized the famous Feodorov Eye Clinic in Moscow, where people from all over the world came to have their eyes repaired. Well, I taught English at his clinic for about three months, and then he fired me. Because as soon as my students started speaking decent English, they would quit and go off and get a job in South Africa, in Germany, in Brazil, in the United States or Canada. So he was losing his best surgeons as soon as they learned English. So he paid me, shook my hand and said, get lost. The Moscow State University named after Lomonosov, the great scientist, established in 1755, shortly before the American Revolution. Well, there's a picture of me with some of my students, two of my students and a, um, a member of the Soviet Academy of Sciences um, standing beside me. And of course, the picture of Lenin, uh, statue of Lenin, uh, behind us, which was still there. Well, I was invited to give a talk on religious studies. How do Americans study religion? We have uh, academic study of religion, because in Russia, religion was not taught at the universities. That was something that only priests and nuns and rabbis and imams did. But they were fascinated that in the United States, you could go to a regular university like Columbia and you could take a class in world religions, the history of Judaism, taught from an academic standpoint, not taught by believing rabbis and priests and imams. So they wanted me to, you know, teach, to, to explain to them how to set up an, a department of religious studies. And I said, you mean you have a department of religious studies at Lamonoso? And they said, oh, yes, of course. Well, I went there. And as I walked into the auditorium, I saw there was a big sign on the wall in paper that said in Cyrillic, the Russian Department of Religious Studies. But it was in paper pasted over something else. So I discreetly lifted up the paper to see what was underneath it. And I realized that it said the Department of Atheism because that is what was taught at the universities, not world religions, but the official teaching of atheism. So here was me, one of the very first Westerners with a degree in world religions from Harvard, making the transition from the Department of Atheism to the Department of Religious Studies. Now, my specialty was ESP, which means Nothing to do with ESP and the brain, but English for special purposes. So what I did, both in Prague and in Budapest and later in Moscow, is a group of people would get together and they would want to learn a specific English skill. So my business manager, Ildis Norgaliev, would he, they would get in contact with him and he said, well, we have a group 
that needs English for this special purpose. One of the classes he set up with me was English for pornography because pornography had become legal. And so they wanted to learn all the English terminology. So we'd sit around reading uh, Playboy and uh, of course, far worse magazines. And I'd explain all of the terminology. Another class I had was English for the Russian mafia, which uh, of course they picked me up in a car uh, from my class. They took me blindfolded to a unknown location where I went in with guards on both sides and I taught them conversational English for the mafia. What are cement shoes, offshore banking, Geneva and Cyprus offshore banks, shakedown and pat. What's the difference between a shakedown and a pat down? I had to explain to them. Payoffs, bribes, hush money, hit men. Well, needless to say, some of my students, especially the women, uh, wore magnificent fur coats like you see on the right. I saw more submachine guns as I walked into their headquarters and they took off the blindfold. But this is ESP. Now we had ESP for mafia, we had English ESP for, for um, porno, we had ESP for doctors, for nurses, for accountants, for travel agencies, for hotel personnel. Well, of course, with the Rupal going up and down, um, as soon as I got a bunch of Rupals, my goal was to get rid of them as fast as I could. So I would take my shopping bag filled with Russian Rupals, which were losing value by the day, and I would go back to the hotel or the dorm where a lot of foreigners were living. And I'd say, okay, who has to pay for something in Russian rubles? What are you giving me? So I'd get big pens, Fruit of the Loom underwear, Winston, Xerox, you know, uh, sanitary napkins, um, uh, black label whiskey, because I had to get rid of all of my rubles the same day, turn them into something material of value because they would lose 10% of their value by the next day. Well, this is the famous five-star hotel in Moscow, overlooking the Moscow River with a beautiful view of the Kremlin. That was one of my more interesting jobs. This hotel was founded in 1898 by the Tsar himself, and it was taken over by the Kempinski uh, chain, which is the luxurious five-star hotel chain uh, in Europe. They also have hotels um, everywhere else in the world. So that was one of my interesting jobs. Well, what was my job there? My job was to teach the staff to, to speak proper English. And so a lot of Russians had experience in working in stores and restaurants, but that was not the kind of experience the Hotel Balchuk Kempinski was interested in. It didn't want some buxomy, a uh, Russian girl with a submachine gun to be uh, serving drinks in the restaurant. It wanted polite five-star status quality work. Well, that was my job, to take these young waiters and to teach them proper five-star hotel English. And in fact, with the advertisement for the hotel, let me close the window. So they needed me to go to the hotel and to teach the staff. Well, I had the run of the hotel. I could go into the restaurant, such as on the left, you see the dining room with a glorious view of the Kremlin. 
Well, my job was to sit down for dinner, order anything on the menu, and pepper the staff with questions, comments, and criticisms to see if their English was up to snuff. So I would pick up my white wine glass and I'd say, excuse me, sir, there is a smudge on my wine glass to see if they knew what I was talking about. Or I would point to my plate and I'd say, I believe my salad fork is not clean to see if they knew which was the salad fork in English. I would go take a room, spend the night, and I would get on the phone and I would say, can you tell me how to access CNN to the lobby? And I would note on my notepad who the person was and if they adequately explained it in proper English. I won't even tell you the great fun I had hanging in the bar as you see below, elegant bar of the 1880s with bar stools and the whole works. I mean, my job was to come up with the most outlandish drink that I could think of. And the Balchukampinsky remains, beautiful view of the Kremlin. You see St. Basil's on the right and the churches and towers inside the Kremlin. And that was my job to make sure their English was five star quality. Interestingly, when I was at the Balcha Kempinski, my boss, who was in charge of personnel, was from what was at one time East Germany. See the map on the left, see the Soviet Union, you see Poland, and you see East Germany. Well, that's where she grew up. So like Angela Merkel, she had to learn Russian in school. She had to take tests to show that she was fluent in Russian before she could graduate from university. Well, just before I got to Moscow, East Germany collapsed. The Berlin Wall fell. The wall between East and West fell. Frau Fischer, my boss, was absolutely thrilled. She says, now I have been studying hotel management for all these years. She said, I can go and get a job in New York or San Francisco or Montreal or even go to Brazil or South Africa or Japan. Well, needless to say, she got the job of her dreams. And where did the Baucho Kempinski Hotel station her? In Moscow. Well, she hated Russians with a passion. And she was absolutely devastated when she was sent to Moscow, but the pay was good, the living was good, and she hired me to teach her English, which was forbidden in East Germany at the time, so that she could get a good job in some exciting place in the West. But these were the kinds of interesting people I met when I was in Berlin or in Moscow. Now, I was there for the summer. Well, Moscow summers begin and never end because they are so far north that I could sit on my balcony at the university and read the newspaper outside without any light until about 11 o'clock at night. Then it would get sort of hazy on the horizon, but then by two o'clock, the sun was up again. Well, the Russians back in those wonderful days loved going to the beach along the Moscow River. On the left, you can see the Moscow River meanders through the city with islands, and it meanders outside the city and after the city to the north and to the south. Well, the Russians love to go swimming naked. So there was the famous Serebrinaya Bor Beach, 
which was notorious as the nudist beach. And I remember there, I'd finish my classes at eight o'clock in the evening. I would catch the subway and go up to the beach, walk down along the river and get to the beach. And we'd be there partying and these motorboats with these Russian babushkas, these Russian grandmothers with their babushka on and a long dress would come by in a motorboat. And they'd be selling vodka and sandwiches and roasted chickens. And I mean, we had some of the most wonderful evenings uh, at the nude beach um, uh, uh, in Moscow. Well, of course, the Russians, even under the communists, very carefully preserved the architecture of Russia. You see the Tretyakov Gallery at the bottom on the left, typical what they call high Russian Baroque architecture. I mean, magnificent collections of icons and of art. The Bolshoi Theater on the right. See the absolute magnificent. Now, since the university didn't have much money to pay me, Anytime I wanted tickets to the Bolshoi uh, Ballet or to the opera, I just had to mention it and they would be on my refrigerator when I got back that evening because they were so eager to keep Western teachers and especially teachers who could speak correct English, could correct other people's English and were educated. On the top left, you see just a few of the great churches and basilicas inside the Kremlin itself, most of these dating from the 1850s. Now, what's interesting is to look at the churches on the left and the, the gallery on the left and contrast it with the Bolshoi. You see the real contradiction in Russian art. On the right, that could be a Greek temple in any place in the West or in Greece. But on the left were unique um, Slavic Russian architecture. Well, of course, money was almost meaningless. So one of the great advantages of Russia, and it still continues, is the Soviets had poured literally billions of dollars every year into culture. And while I was there, the tickets were next to nothing. Look at the Bolshoi Ballet ticket from when I was there uh, in the upper left. You see, um, it's in, uh, was three rubles, 20 kopecks, which when I was there was probably about 10 cents. Uh, but yet they had printed so many tickets that they um, um, didn't have the money to print new tickets. And so sometimes they would stamp on it and the price kept going up. But the great Russian literature and music was really the high point of my time there. The operas of uh, Glinka, who lived 1804, 1857, his famous legendary Russian story of czars and princesses Ruslan and Ludmila. And so um, Pushkin's on the right playbill for one of Pushkin's um, uh, great uh, theater pieces. That was really the high point of, uh, um, of my time in Moscow, because if you go to an opera and seeing magnificent performers, lavish stage settings, and I was getting the tickets for free because the university was so eager to keep me there. But psychologically, it was a difficult time because a lot of the older people, my students, firmly believed in socialism and in Marxism. It was the economy that collapsed. In the West, we're taught, oh, the people opposed it and everything. But the vast majority of Russians supported the communist system, but it was the economy that collapsed. And they realized that the economic system could no longer support 
the massive payouts of billions of dollars a year for art, for music, and for education. And that was really one of the most tragic um, uh, aspects of my trip there was to see how the people were suffering. Another wonderful aspect of Moscow were the uh, bathhouses, hot water, baths, um, getting massages, and they were literally magnificent. Uh, of course, you had more simpler banos uh, where the people would go and for a very little amount of money could get a sauna and a massage and have a drinks and vodka. But some of the saunas, the hammams as they called them, were absolutely lavish. And I spent many a wonderful hour in these. Of course, as a Westerner, they'd let me in almost for free and they'd encourage people to go up and talk to me to practice their English. Another thing I discovered during my time there was the glories of Russian Soviet sci-fi um, films, Andrei Tarkovsky, uh, his famous uh, books, his famous films, Stalker and Solaris. Uh, Solaris was uh, recently released uh, in the West. You see George Clooney's uh, um, interpretation of Solaris. The cinemas were absolutely magnificent. Now, one of the advantages of living there when I was there was as a teacher, they wanted me to keep, they wanted to keep me. If I wanted a ticket for the ballet, I got a ticket for the ballet. If I wanted a bottle of vodka, I got 10. If I wanted a box of dried fish, I got a case of dried fish. So I just, just barely mentioned what I would like to do and the tickets were there. Well, my business manager, Ildis Norgaliev, was from Kazan, which is the Muslim Republic in the middle of Russia. See in the map at the bottom left, you see Moscow, Nizhny Novgorod, and Kazan. It's more than a city. It is a republic that was populated by Mongols. Here on the right, on the right, you see the golden horde of Genghis Khan and all of these people. Well, a whole bunch of them decided to settle in what is today Kazan. And as the picture above shows, they remain uh, very Muslim. And you see magnificent mosques. This is the Kremlin of Kazan. But you see the Russians built their Russian Orthodox Church, but they also permitted the building of mosques. So my friend Ildis not only spoke Tatar Mongol, but he was a Muslim, even though he was living in um, Moscow. Well, he invited me to visit his family in Kazan. So, on the right, you see the magnificent Moscow railroad stations. The one at the bottom is the Kazansky Voxal, uh, which is the Kazan train station. Once again, this magnificent Russian architecture. Above is another one of the train stations. Well, when I was there, Russia was in chaos. So whenever you took the train, you always made sure you had a wire coat hanger with you. So that when you were in your cabin on the train, your cubicle, you could wire the door closed because the Russian mafia, my former students, would get on the train, they would spray gas underneath the door of the train pry it open, and they would rob everybody blind. So, I mean, luckily I was traveling with Ildis and a couple of other guys. So there were four guys in the cabin. So we knew that you went, you peed before you got into bed and you kept um, uh, a bottle on the floor so that if you did have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you would never dare open the door because you might not live to tell about it. One of the adventures of wonderful travel. 
The Kazan Republic today has a population of 1 million. You see the border below. Above on the left, there's me. That's Ildis on the right. That is the president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences in the middle, holding the fish. And on the left was a typical Tatar Mongol from Kazan. You can see very Mongol look, dark hair, uh, slanted eyes. On the right is the new mosque they were building because with the collapse of communism, they were building mosques and churches all over the place. And they were bringing in imams. This imam, which I met there in Kazan, was actually a British Muslim who went over there to teach the people of Kazan Arabic, to teach them the correct way to prayer and Islamic law, which had all been forbidden under the Marxist. Another wonderful experience in Russia is this magnificent wooden architecture. Look at the shingles on that roof on the dome made with small blocks of uh, wood pieced together. In the upper right, you see a, a private house elaborately decorated with wood carvings. Below that, there's me. Uh, visiting uh, some of the old wooden houses. A woman had given me a uh, carved wooden egg, which she had decorated. And this was a Russian tradition, a uh, Slavic tradition, which is very highly respected. Many of the Russians who came over to the United States brought their wood carving skills with them. And it wasn't just Russia, but in Poland and Slovakia and a bit in Prague, they maintained this tradition of wood carving. You see the frames on the right and on the left. This was a wooden house, highly decorated. Well, my father, my real name is not Brown. My name is Boronovsky from Slovakia, bordering on the Ukraine. Well, my father brought this wood carving tradition with him. Well, he didn't bring it with him. His grandfather was a wood carver who taught his father and who taught my father. And here you see at the top all the wood carvings that my father did, which most of which I now have. Below is a picture of a wooden frame that my father had carved in his later years and had put in a family of the Boronovsky, uh, a picture of the Boronovsky clan. On the right was a giant wooden cross, which my father did, which was placed on the top of our church in rural Pennsylvania, where it is at today. Well, another trip I took while I was in Russia was to the Ukraine, which had just declared its independence from Russia. Well, I didn't know that it had declared its independence. So uh, with a bunch of students who invited me to go to Kiev, I just jumped on the train and we went to Kiev, had a great time. Then when we got on the train to go back to Moscow, we were stopped at the border. And everybody was wondering, why are they stopping us at the border? And the Ukrainian military came up and they said, where is your Ukrainian visa? Well, very stupidly, I said, well, when I came down to Ukraine last week, there was no Ukraine. It just declared its independence this weekend. So how can I have a visa to a country which didn't exist? Well, needless to say, he was ready to kill me because he said the Ukraine has been here forever. You speak like a chauvinistic Russian. So I paid a fine and got my uh, retroactive visa and got back to Moscow. Another wonderful trip was to St. Petersburg. Once again, you see the contrast in architecture. At the top, you see one of the cathedrals. It could be in France or it could be in Italy or Spain, very Roman and Greek influence with a big equestrian statue in front of it. Below that, you see one of the very, very Russian looking 
Slavic looking churches, almost Eastern over one of the many canals of St. Petersburg. Well, I got to Moscow in the summer of 92 and I left in the middle of the winter of 93. What defeated me was the never ending night, the bitter cold. I would get up in the morning at eight o'clock. It was pitch black, bitter cold. You'd get an hour or two of faint sunlight and by three or four o'clock it was pitch black. These are the famous and glorious white nights. Well, they may have been white because of the snow, but it was not to my liking. So like Napoleon and like Hitler, who were both defeated by the infamous General Winter, that was the most powerful military general in Russia, was General Winter. And so you see the Petit Journal, uh, and it says, Le General Hiver, General Winter, the most clever military general in Russian history. And on the right, you see the Kremlin take, taking off the snow from Red Square. And that was what really demolished me. The summers were glorious. The winters were horrendous. So that brings us to an end, discovering what it means to the Russians when they say that they are the third Rome, that Moscow is the third Rome. This is, as Joseph Campbell calls it, the power of myth, that Moscow and Russia is more than just another people. But as Putin clearly exemplifies, Russia is a major world power with a divine destiny. Well, New York, where I live, has very much the same mentality. We are the Empire City. New York is not Boston or Philadelphia or Chicago or Cleveland. New York is the Empire City. And don't forget, it was George Washington himself who called New York for the very first time the Empire City, when New York was the cultural, the economic, and under George Washington, even the political capital of the United States. So that brings us to an end of our discovery of what Moscow is all about. So uh, just a reminder, I'm going to be back with you again, again on December 17th for the fascinating city of Petra in Jordan, which I'm sure a lot of you have uh, visited. And now I would love to hear some of your comments, questions, or insights on the wonderful city of Moscow. Great. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, again, a terrific program. I'm I'm always writing myself little notes and, and uh, things that I'm, I'm learning along the way. So uh, uh, again, terrific program today. I, I had no idea about Russian science fiction and the role that it uh, was part of Russian culture or uh, uh, that Caesar translates into czar as a, was a, a new piece of uh, information I learned today as well. So let me go to the, um, the, the, the chat here. Again, if anybody has a question, you can either type it in there or raise your hand and uh, uh, be happy to uh, have you unmute. Um, first comment here, Alice, I see your hand, I'll be right with you, um, uh, is from Marty uh, Farber. My wife and I spent two weeks in the USSR in 1987. Ruble, rubles were worthless and we paid with cigarettes. Many interesting experiences. Uh, also was a soldier in Germany in 1957 and 58, pre-wall, visited East Berlin by merely taking the subway. It was like walking into the 19th century. Uh, thanks for fascinating talk. Did you ever fly within the USSR? Well, actually flying, I never did. I took the train and uh, no, actually I did. 
when I went from Budapest to Moscow to begin my stay there, I actually did uh, fly. I think I flew the Czech Airlines. But when I left uh, the following year, I took the train and I stopped off to visit friends in Budapest and then in Prague, then back to Paris. Now you were talking about uh, using cigarettes as, um, as, as for cash. Well, I have a story which is horrendous because I would get my pay in rubles and it'd be a bundle of rubles this thick. And like I said, I had to get rid of them as quickly as possible. So I remember once I picked up my pay uh, and there was a German girl behind me who was teaching German and she picked up her pay. And I said, oh, I said, I'm going to the uh, stadium because that's where we got rid of our ruples and bought whatever we could just to liquidate our ruples. And she said, you know what I have? She said, I just came from Germany and she had a box this big of women's sanitary napkins, uh, German. And I looked, and I mean, I didn't even think a minute. I mean, I bought them on the spot because she needed ruples to buy a train ticket. Well, the funny part is I walked back across campus with this giant box on my shoulder and it was clearly marked in German and in English, you know, the sanitary napkins or something like that. Well, by the time I got back to the dorm or the where I was living, I had like about 25 Russian girls following me because they want, they needed them. You know, they were good quality uh, German. But then the problem only began because one woman showed up and she had a big box of uh, Vietnamese sardines. So I had to calculate how many sanitary napkins equals one can of Vietnamese sardines? So, I mean, we were sitting there, I'd get ballpoint pens, I would get bottles of vodka and everything. So you had to know the black market price of everything. So, you know, but uh, basic things like uh, women's sanitary napkins were, were, you know, worth their weight in gold. I know um, a lot of you remember probably the big pens were worth their weight in gold. When I was there, cartridges for the photocopy machine. I mean, um, they would give you the, the czar's crown for a, um, um, you know, for a cartridge or a, a ream of paper, you know, whatever it's a thousand pages in a paper. I mean, these were very difficult to get. And so you had to be a real, uh, businessman to, to support all this so but it was great fun you know but you know the thing is luckily if push came to shove i could always go into a nice restaurant pull out my american express card and i could have a great wine and a great meal so i really existed in two worlds you know i learned the russian daily life for the russian but then i could also you know, uh, go to a nice hotel and have a great meal and use my American Express, which most Russians could not do, so. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so there's a couple more questions here in the chat, but Alice, you had raised your hand and then I think- Yes, Alice. Rest. So you should be able to unmute now, Alice. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for it was splendid. And you brought back so many memories to me. Uh, first of all, my father came from Kiev and uh, uh, his family ran a Turkish bath. So you showed the equivalent. Um, and I, gee, I can't get out of this screen, but uh, here I am. Oh, sorry. Anyway. I was at the Hotel Kempinski in Berlin. I don't know if you can see it. I think I brought this home. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, right. And uh, it was one of the most beautiful places. We had high tea, uh, and the ladies wore their uh, uh, you know, the heavy shoes, and, but they were dowagers and very, it was just lovely. So thank you for bringing such beautiful memories back. Well, thank you very much. I am glad you appreciate that.
that I loved the Balchuk Kempinskate. And it was something that I really didn't know about, but I found out later that they are really the uh, uh, an unknown gem of yes. hotels. I mean, most Americans, you know, they'll stick with the big American chains. But when you go into the Balchuk Kaminsky, in, in Moscow, in fact, I went in there once and there was a gathering of Russian aristocracy that was there. And they told me, they said, well, our ancestors used to have tea and have meals at the Balchuk uh, back in the imperial days. And, I, and it was just a absolutely um, thrilling story. So. Well, thank you for sharing that plate with us. Did you steal it or buy it at the uh, Berlin? Well, uh, listen, I uh, I didn't steal it. I just took charge of it. Took oh, possession. Okay. You know, and in fact, I was looking for it because I really, when you said Kempinski, I you know who uh, leaves ashtrays around, but I put lemon slices on it when I ah. served. So I found it while you were talking. I went. And uh, also, we had relatives in Russia who came over, and they couldn't believe when my husband took it to a diner, the food was <laughs> flowing off the plate. And when they saw a banana or a banana, they start to giggle because they mm. had never enjoyed. It was a delight. They just couldn't believe how we lived in this country. I know. Well, you know, when I was in Berlin for the first time, I spent a summer there and it was East and West. Well, as an American, I could go through Checkpoint Charlie. Well, I was in my early 20s. So what I would do is I would buy um, a dozen oranges or bananas and I'd put them in a transparent plastic bag and I would walk through Checkpoint Charlie and I would go to this lovely little cafe, which was under the train at Alexanderplatz. And when I got there, I usually had 25 East Germans following me and they would buy my oranges or bananas. I was allowed to take through a dozen legally. And from that dozen oranges or bananas, I got enough East German marks at the time which allowed me to invite all of my friends from East Berlin. We would go to restaurants, we'd go to the opera, we'd go to the ballet. And then at the last minute, since I was limited, I think it was 12 hours, I'd go running down the street to Checkpoint Charlie and the Russians were on one side and the Americans were on the other and they knew me by then. And they would be yelling in Russian and German and English, run, Ron, run, Ron. You have one more minute to get through Checkpoint Charlie, or are you going to spend the rest of your life in Siberia? So, <laughs> but those were the crazy things you do when you're in your 20s. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that with us, Alice. That was very nice, very yeah. interesting. Yes, thank you, Alex. Uh, Alice. Um, and Miriam, you, you had your hand raised, I believe. You can unmute yourself now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. I can hear you. I just wanted to say that I really, really appreciate all your lectures. Uh, you are the luckiest man to be able to see all these countries, to travel and to talk about it. So really, really thank you so much for all the effort. And I wanted to ask, how can I watch this recorded program again? Oh, sure. Um, so that is something you will uh, eventually be able to find on YouTube. Um, if you go to YouTube and search Port Washington Library, um, you will find a whole listing of many of uh, Ron's past talks. Usually takes um, a couple of weeks at least for us to basically make just getting around to editing it and, and getting it posted. So it will be back up there, um, hopefully in you know two or three weeks. You'll be able to Thank find you. It there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, sure. thank you very much, Mayor, for, for, uh, for saying that. Very nice. So I have um, uh, a couple more than a couple more hands raised here. So there is um, a question from Jeff who says, um, how and what was the food like in Moscow? And then which opera singers did you hear at the Bolshoi? Mm. The food, the food was wonderful. I mean, um, my friend Misha and his wife and their daughter 
had the nasty habit of calling me um, at like about six o'clock on the weekends and saying, Ron, we're going out to get gribi. Gribi in Russian means mushrooms. And they would, we'd pick all the mushrooms and stuff, and then they'd take them to a cabin that they had in the woods, and, and they would pickle them in vinegar and spices and stuff. And these were things like this, which were very natural, which they'd make themselves, which were absolutely delightful. Um, sausages were really, really uh, great. Uh, dried fish that they'd catch in the Moscow River. And during the summer, you'd lay them out in the sun. And uh, within a couple of hours, they were hard as a rock. And that we would chew on when we would drink the cheap Russian beer. And um, the, the Russian food was very good. The dumplings were uh, wonderful. Um, it was a hearty, hearty, good meal. I mean, it wasn't elegant, but it was uh, really very, very good. The Russian pastries were good. Um, of course, the Russian vodka. I'm not a great vodka drinker, but, um, you know, um, it, was, um, it was good. Now, the opera singers, I can't tell you. I don't have the brochures here. Uh, I was not so much interested in the, the person who was singing. Now, I do know that when I was there, um, most of the Russian uh, opera divas and singers and uh, musicians were still in Russia. They hadn't started in 91 and 92, the great migration to the West which I will say uh, phenomenally enriched Western opera, Western ballet, Western uh, orchestras with this massive influx of very highly qualified and skilled and talented uh, Russian uh, artists who flooded in everywhere. I mean, I went to uh, the when I was in spring break this past year, I was in Mexico City and I went to the Philharmonic Orchestra. Well, when I looked at the program, I was convinced that half of the musicians were German and German Jews who had fled uh, Hitler and the other half were new Russian arrivals. And you saw Russian names all over the place, Russian conductors, and um, it um, very much enriched uh, Western art. Plus, a lot of these people introduced Americans to composers like Glinka, who was one of my favorite Russian composers, um, which, um, which were rarely performed in the West. But with this influx of Russians, they brought the whole repertoire of Russians. Now, I know the Russians look down upon American artists and musicians and dancers as being not well trained because the Russians were very severe in their classical training of, uh, of artists, but uh, they uh, definitely, uh, it, it enriched the Western uh, music uh, and artistic tradition. Great, uh, so another question here in the chat and then I see the two hands that are raised. I'm just trying to go in order here. Um, this is from Bernard. I am intrigued by the fact that in some ways life in Russia is or was very restricted in that the freedom of the individual is limited, but in other ways people are pragmatic and less rule bound than in the West. For example, the university could get you whatever you want and health and safety is, I'm, not, I'm told, not an obsession. Were you struck by this too? Well, the Russians have a different attitude towards freedom. I mean, as I said during the talk, you know, the United States doesn't appreciate the fact that we are protected by two oceans. And that is a major factor in this isolationism, manifest destiny. Geography really shaped American identity. Whereas Russia, on the other hand, I mean, if you have the militant Japanese, the militant Germans, and the militant Chinese, and a whole middle range of Muslims, surrounding you, if you are not well-armed, aggressive, and protecting yourself, uh, you could disappear, disappear from the face of the earth pretty fast. And so it's the ge geography which 
determines your national identity. Now think of like Israel. I mean, little tiny Israel uh, perched on the edge of the Muslim world, surrounded by a billion and a half Muslims. I mean, when the Israelis view their security, they view it in that way. I mean, Israel could disappear tomorrow, billion and a half Muslims. I mean, that's why they say um, Israel has to win every war. If it loses one war, it will disappear. And Russia, the same thing, it was invaded by Napoleon, it was invaded by Hitler, it was invaded by Sweden, invaded by the Muslims from the South, uh, the Japanese, the Chinese. So it is a country surrounded by enemies. And that really uh, determines, in, in one sense, why the Russians need a strong leader and a strong national identity uh, to protect themselves from these um, surrounding uh, enemies. Now, I, at this point, I forgot what the question was. So can you read it again, Jess, so I can see? Sure, sure. it was essentially that um, you know, there was a lot of limitations on individual freedoms, um, but that people oh, yes. were also uh, in some ways less rule bound than in the West, and that things such as health and safety were not an obsession. And, and whether okay. you, you right. experience that too. Right. Well, th that's the fact that the Russians um, don't value individuality the same way as Americans do, because we are protected. You know, we have two big oceans and we have a very um, poorly populated uh, Canada to the north and we have rather underdeveloped Mexico to the south. So we're really not afraid of being invaded. So celebrate individual liberty, even anarchy, whereas in Russia, um, surrounded by enemies, the people's individual liberty is uh, subordinated to the national security. So I found that to be very, very true. I mean, and so often Americans will, you know, uh, criticize countries like China today, saying, oh, they don't have the individual freedom that we do, but China has that same collective mentality. In Chinese uh, culture, it comes from Confucianism, which is a collective uh, mentality. And in Russia, they need a strong czar. In fact, they have pictures of Putin wearing the crown of the czar because they need a strong uh, uh, imperial leader. And the vast majority of the people um, accept it. They don't... Uh, um, uh, think that it's a bad thing because without a strong leader, they believe Russia would just deteriorate into anarchy as it was when I was there. I mean, uh, it was a very dangerous time. I mean, many, like I said, with the train. I mean, you didn't wire your cabin closed with a good, strong metal um, um, coat hanger. Uh, you would probably be robbed. And especially when they see me as an American, I would have been a prime target. So, I mean, the, uh, uh, you, you had to be on guard at all times. Let's see. So, Jamie, I see that you have your hand raised. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Yes. Hi, Jamie. Yes, hi there, Ron. Um, you spoke about you, you, you the incident on the train. What about in everyday life? Um, in the cities in uh, Russia, in terms in terms of crime, I'm getting to you know um, as compared to the United States here. If you watch the nightly news, of course, it's it's a, it's a disgrace to the rest of the world what we look like. What is what is crime like in uh, in Russia? And then also, second part to the question: What or how did the different ethnic groups get along with one another? It's not one homogeneous country, right? Isn't it made up of all these different groups? And how do they get along? So, a two part question. Thank you. Okay. Um, about crime. Now, remember, I was there in the early 90s. The government was very, very weak. Yeltsin was a weak ruler. Uh, the country was literally falling apart with Ukraine and Belarus and Latvia and Lithuania, Central Asian republics, all declaring their independence. The police force was literally paralyzed. Half of the police hadn't been paid in months. And so in the 90s, early 90s, when I was there, 
it was very dangerous. I remember walking down the main street and I was surrounded by a whole bunch of uh, gypsy kids and they would literally steal the shoes off of your feet. Their hands would be in your pockets. And luckily um, some people came up with clubs and beat them off. So, I mean, it was dangerous. Uh, my dorm, luckily I was living at the university. And so uh, they had a security guard who was armed at the gate uh, because it was a dangerous situation. Unemployment was horrendous. I was a target because I was a foreigner. I mean, they figured that uh, I was a uh, fair game. But I'll tell you, and don't tell, tell, ever tell anybody I said that, but that's when my Russian mafia students came in handy. Because if anything would ever happen, I would mention it to my students and that situation was rectified. I mean, uh, I had an incident with one of my fellow teachers who was robbed and clothes and uh, computer and everything was gone. And I mentioned it to my student, uh, needless to say, within a matter of hours that it was funny, the laptop was back on her desk in her room, which was locked. So, I mean, they at least, you know, broke into the room again and replaced everything. So it was a dangerous time uh, to be there. Um, I had to be careful where I would go in restaurants. I would stick to the big hotels, which did have security. There was a lot of anger because, as I said, a lot of Russians um, firmly believed in communism, the ideology, and they would um, see their world collapsing. I think the most sad people were people who had worked their whole lives, survived in the Soviet system, and were approaching retirement. And with inflation, they saw they were getting no, next to nothing, in retirement. It would be like us if, uh, so if um, uh, inflation would hit the United States and the dollar would collapse. I mean, uh, those of us who are living on Social Security suddenly find that your Social Security is 10% of what you thought it was going to be. There was a lot of uh, um, uh, anger, uh, a lot of um, very um, uncomfortable people which is again why the people think so highly of Vladimir Putin, because in a very um, hostile and chaotic world of uh, um, the world today, he is at least keeping the country safe. Now you mentioned ethnic groups. Um, the Soviet Union, yes, the um, Russians were by far the largest ethnic group. But then there were Ukrainians, there were Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, Georgians, Azerbaijanis, Armenians. These are all republics within the Soviet Union, as well as Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and these republics of Central Asia. Now, under the Soviet system, everybody was supposed to American style melt. And the Soviet government encouraged Jews to marry non-Jews, Russians to marry Armenians, uh, Muslims from Central Asia to marry Lithuanians. These were the types of marriages which were encouraged. So you became a Soviet citizen. Now, when, and that was, you know, if you could go to a university and you'd say, oh, my mother's Armenian and my father was Central Asian Muslim and I'm living in Moscow, I mean, people would break out in cheers because you were the true Soviet citizen, sort of like the American melting pot in overdrive. Now, when I was there and the Soviet Union was collapsing, everybody was reverting back to their tribal ethnic identity. When I was in Kiev, I stayed with a professor and his wife, and, and, and his wife, right. 
he was Armenian and she was Muslim from Central Asia. Well, their first language was, of course, Russian. And he was teaching at the University of Kiev. He was the ideal Soviet citizen. Well, as soon as the Ukraine left the Soviet Union, became the Ukrainian Republic, suddenly the University of Kiev announced all classes as of September will be taught in Ukrainian. Half of the professors didn't speak Ukrainian. And they were forced to retire. They brought in people to replace them. And um, they were really, they went from being the prized Soviet citizen to be the despised mongrel um, of an ancient system that had collapsed. And that I found across the board that um, uh, half of my friends would say, I'm half Jewish, I'm half Russian, I'm half Jewish, I'm half Ukrainian or Lithuanian, which after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they found themselves neither here nor there. And that encouraged a lot of people uh, to leave. I mean, a very good friend of mine, Pavel, I mean, he was uh, half Jewish and half Ukrainian Christian. And um, uh, he spoke Russian, even though he lived in Kiev. And since he didn't speak Ukrainian and he was a mongrel, um, he was kicked out of the Academy of Music and ended up getting a PhD from Juilliard in New York. And here again, uh, enriching the American cultural scene. So the ethnic groups remain a major problem as Ukraine uh, wants to get rid of its Russians. And as we saw, Russia invaded um, Eastern Ukraine, took over the Crimean Peninsula because that area was predominantly Russian speaking, ethnic Russians that the Ukrainians would say, well, you might speak Russian, you might be ethnic Russian, but you're in the Ukraine now. So you have to send your kids to a Ukrainian school and you have to identify as Ukrainian and many of the Russians said, no, we are not Ukrainian. So when Putin invaded uh, Eastern Ukraine and took over the Crimea, I mean, he didn't say I'm invading another country. He said, I'm liberating Russians from ethnic oppression in another country. So the issue, your, your question is right on target it, and it remains an extremely complex situation until today. Oh, very interesting. Um, so I have another question here in the chat and then Judy, uh, I'll get right to you. So uh, Lauren asks, uh, wonders how you learned Russian and how well you spoke it. And then how did you feel about teaching the Russian mafia? <laughs> well, um, when I got to Eastern Europe, you know, I, I lived for a semester in Prague, then I was a year, a sum summer in Vienna, and I was a year in Budapest. Well, when I got to, uh, when I was in these places, I knew I was going to go to Russia. That was really my goal. So even when I was in Prague, I hired an unemployed Russian language teacher to give me private lessons, which made the Czechs hate me, saying, you're in Czechoslovakia, why are you learning Russian? You should be learning Czech. And I said, well, you know, learning another small language like Czech is not gonna be very useful in the future. And I said the same thing of in Hungarian, which was extremely complex language, I was studying Russian. So when I got to Russia, I knew basic conversation. I would never say I speak Russian because for me, when I say I speak a language, that means I can sit down, have a cup of coffee and we can talk for a couple of hours and have a nice conversation. So the only languages I say I actually speak fluently are English, French, German, and Hebrew. I mean, uh, I get by in Spanish, I can get by in Russian, but I would never say I speak it, but I studied it. I have a good knowledge of it, but I would never go be so pretentious to say I speak the language because I, um, I do not. And was there a second part to that question? There was a second part. So, I, and you referenced it earlier. So what, uh, what were your thoughts uh, about teaching the Russian mafia how to speak English? Oh, well, 
Well, number one, when the head of the Russian mafia asks you to come to his compound and teach his people English, you don't say no. So um, I took it as a phenomenal experience. Um, on, and like I said, the situation in Russia was chaotic. And if the computer lab hadn't couldn't get a hold of cartridges for the printer, I always knew the Russian mafia would. So, um, and I'll tell you a lot of the people who were part of the Russian mafia, I mean, when we say mafia in the United States, we think of drug dealers and all of that. But I mean, ask any old Italian woman what she thinks of mafia in New York City, and it's a cross between Mother Teresa and the Red Cross. And I had a, uh, uh, my neighbor, an elderly Italian woman, and we were talking about this once. And she said that when my husband was sick and in the hospital, I could always count on either the Catholic Church or the mafia to make sure there was a box of groceries on my front porch once a week. And she said she didn't question where it was coming from. So, I mean, that the Italian mafia originally, even in the United States, was a self protective uh, organization for low class Italian immigrants surviving in a very hostile environment. And the Russian mafia at that time. Um, um, fulfilled that role. I know one woman whose husband was sick and her son was coming to my class. I ran into one of my mafia friends at their house having tea. And um, when, uh, of course, I didn't acknowledge that I knew him. And then when I, when he left, I asked uh, my student, I said, you know, who was this guy? And he said, oh, he's the guy who brings my mother a box of food every week. So, here again, you know, you have to say in what circumstances um, uh, do you use the word mafia? I mean, we use it as drug dealers. We talk about the, you know, um, prostitution, gambling, and all of that. But um, there are other approaches to the mafia. So, you know, uh, and like I said, in Russia at those times, very dangerous times, I mean, they would be very good. They would they would convert money. I was not allowed to convert money, even though some of my private students, I worked for like IBM and these companies which were just moving in uh, and building buildings. And so they would hire me to teach their higher executives uh, business English. And I asked them to pay me in American dollars and they did. So I had access to American dollars. Uh, and so, I mean, when people would need dollars, um, I would you know, exchange them. So, you know, it, it's, uh, I'll tell you, it was a unique period. I mean, you can say um, um, how it was during those uh, very troubled years. I mean, but um, I managed to survive.